I don't all right, see those it's comments. all yours, Nicole. Okay, great. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so today we're going to talk about company structure and why you need a management team to work through. Um, I would like to introduce my panelists. We have Stephanie Brook, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Competitive Edge Performance in Florida. And then we have Latoya Yang, who is the Office Administrator at True Sports in Maryland. So, uh, and then of course we have Brian Gallagher, who is the founder of Meg Business Management. And I am Nicole, I'm the Chief De Development Officer here at Meg. Um, Today we want to really focus in on this idea of how do we create a structure and establish the management team, and then how do we work through that management team and, and manage by statistics. Um, I'm going to have Matthew put up a couple of links. We have the Contact Us link, and if you would like to learn more specifically about your practice, you can certainly reach into us and ask to um, set up a practice assessment with us. Uh, but we also have the link for the company structure worksheet, and that's just a tool to utilize to analyze your own structure or to develop your structure moving forward. I wanted to also point out that this will be our last Zoom chat. I, I feel like um, well, everybody's ramping back up and it's summertime and uh, we understand that you guys are getting back more active in your clinics. So we will meet again in July. It will be the last Zoom chat for this month and we will be going to once a month Zoom chat. So uh, we love hearing from you guys. If you have questions, keep bringing them in and we will bring them on these Zoom chat platforms and we will answer them um, or visit our Facebook page and you can put that up, Matthew, as well. Um, if you if you want to post any questions there, we'll, we'll try and get to them as well. Um, I want to kick it off by starting with Stephanie and we're going to chat just a little bit about how things were pre-COVID and also you know, during COVID, how did you manage and how did your practice respond? And then we'll talk about the recovery efforts and where you're at right now. So if you can kind of set that stage, that would be great, Stephanie. Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, as Nicole said, my name is Stephanie and I am the CEO at Competitive Edge. And I have been working here um, since 2010, I came on board and um, our owner, Jason Waz, who a lot of you listeners might know from New PT Tech, um, he and I uh, pretty much have been running the show for a while and then have recently in the last few years added several more therapists and kind of branched out to two pretty much full-time locations. So uh, that's just a little bit of background of how I started. Um, and I think I've served probably for the past two years, maybe a little over, of that CEO role. So um, and that was a byproduct of our MEG training, which I can get into a little bit later. But yeah. Um, basically, a, an idea of what our company was looking like pre-COVID, um, we actually had our best staff meeting ever um, the week that shutdown started. So it was one of those staff meetings where Jason was like actually applauding our team, which that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything was kind of all systems go. Uh, everything, everything was clicking, basically. We were at our max numbers. We were getting ready to add another therapist. So obviously COVID hit, a, hit the brakes on that a little bit. Um, but we were really fortunate to have both the leadership that we had at, with Jason and then, you know, myself with trying to you know, keep everybody on pace and on board uh, once the shutdown started and, and we started to see people drop off the schedule. Um, and we really relied heavily on that culture of adaptability that we've been working to create among our staff for the last several years. And um, I'm so proud of them and, and of all of us because we were really able to maintain a significant amount of our caseload. We were probably at maybe 60 to 75 percent of our caseload for most of the COVID type times, which is pretty good for you know, considering what our population is. And we do see a lot of Medicare age population and things like that. And uh, fortunately with Meg2, uh, we were hooked up with Daniel Seidler from TelePT Solutions. And so we were able to jump on board with, you know, you know, telehealth and we were able to adapt that quickly. And I think that that's a product, both of our team being able to adapt, but then also our leadership to say, look, this is our plan. This is our goal. We need to pivot right now. <laughs> like, let's do it. And so I think just having that certainty of, knowing what to do and, and at least how we were going to approach and tackle it was was really uh, beneficial for us during that time. And then now we're back up to about 90, 95% of pre-COVID. Awesome. 
pretty much back to normal and we're now exploring that pulling on of another uh, PT. So we're, we're okay. revisiting that that we were supposed to do a few months ago then <laughs> jumping sure. back on board with that, so. Excellent. Well, way to go to kind of tread until you get to this point where we're yeah. in the recovery <laughs> efforts. So that, kudos to you. You know, that. Nicole, I'll even add to that. What's really amazing about that is, Stephanie, you're in Florida and you're coming out of your season, right? Florida yes. has somewhat of a fluctuated yes. season. So mm-hmm. it just shows you there's that much of a pent up demand that you're seeing yes. your numbers surge and you're literally going into the summer months <laughs> in Florida, which is unheard of. Yes. yes. Yep, and it's ne- the elective surgeries are coming back, and you know, yeah, people need yeah, us. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, we we were really fortunate, you know, because our our patient population, um, based on the structure and what we were trying to achieve as a clinic, our goals for really um, establishing that that true sense of care and relationships with our patients, we were able to really leverage that to to be open, transparent with them, and say, look, we are doing everything that we can to keep you safe and to yeah. to make sure you're still receiving the care that you need, and, and really. Um, I, I feel very fortunate that they trusted us with that message and trusted us with their health, both, you know, protecting them from, you know, getting COVID and then, but also keep them healthy, active, all the stuff that we know is necessary to help the community and to, um, kind of keep on top of them to make sure they're not letting themselves, you know, letting themselves go during that time. So. Okay. That's an important, that's an important message, especially to share with the people in the Northeast who are really, really sensitive to this topic because they were hit so hard. And to them, it's very much of a risk factor for a lot of their people to even contemplate coming back in. But like you said, there is an avenue to create an environmental reengineering for safe environment to create proper policies and procedures for procedural handling of patients and proper personnel training and management for proper conduct for safety of your staff. There is a way through, but sometimes when you're in other parts of the country where it's really difficult, you're running up against that mental barrier, that mental challenge, because there have been so many deaths and so many sick people that a lot of people know about in that Northeast, which other parts of the country, yours, one of them, not so much. But I do believe that if everybody's committed to doing what's in the best interest, both environmentally, policy procedures, and personnel-wise, you can actually achieve a good, safe, healthy environment and handle you know, people with their conditions. So yeah. thank you for coming on and explaining that and sharing that because you are succeeding at that. Right. And then just realizing there may be altered timelines and there may be you yeah. know, altered approaches and what you have to go about you know, based on certain restrictions you have even um, you yeah. know, from your state restrictions. So sure. and it um, may take longer, like you said, Nicole, it just may yes. be the same process, but it just may right. be drawn out a little bit longer. So there is a right. safe way to do it for you, each individual right. person listening. Exactly. I, I do want to back up a little bit, Stephanie, and, and talk because and I, I've had the pleasure of being your coach. So I know I've gotten to see your progress along the way, but can you tell us a little bit about, you know, pre-MEG and, and what your issues were in terms of organization? Sure. Um, yeah. So I, again, I gave you the background of, I came on board in 2010 and Jason, our owner was also a treating therapist, a full-time treating therapist. Um, and he and I were the only two therapists in, in competitive edge. So we were the only two um, here for, I would say probably five years or so. And wow. every year we kind of talk about adding, but then it's yeah. tough add and then we feel like well we have the volume to support adding other therapists you know that all those discussions come up and had we known you know now that if you you know you're 80 percent you know 20 percent kind of thing where it's it's definitely time to add another therapist and then build their schedule and then fill that clinical director back in as far as you know kind of shifting people to the new new hire anyways um i think if if we would have known that we would have been expanding a lot sooner um, so yes, yeah, so we plugged along from probably 2010 to 2016, I would say, and then we're trying to see, we're like, okay, we're, we're stagnant, you know, it's the same number of visits a year, um, you know, our overhead increases, but we're still seeing the same number of patients, and so then it starts to become a little bit difficult, um, you know, to, to kind of continue with that. And so then Jason started looking at the numbers and is like, Hey, this, this isn't going to work. We need to, we need to get something going on. So, um, then we were looking at adding another PTA and then, so she came on board, I believe that was late 2017, maybe I can't remember the timeline. Um, and it was just, not good. I mean, we, we had, uh, looking at our schedule and the numbers of who we were seeing during those years is just crazy compared to now because it's, it's insane. But 
Um, so then we really, Jason started really doing a lot of soul searching and is like, look, I can't sustain this business if we don't make a plan and, and do it. Cause it's the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And that's what we had been doing. And although our patients loved us, we were providing excellent care, cutting edge, like technology, all that stuff. There, there's only so much you can do with that. And then it's not scalable if you're not scaling. So, um, uh, so then Jason got hooked up with um, Brian and then we started talking about, okay, do we, do we do this or not? Cause it's hard to think about, well, why do we invest money in this when we're already having a hard time making payroll, <laughs> you know, but yes. it was important and we knew the importance of it. I was on board. I was like, we have to, we have to get this going. Cause I know that we have a great product and a great clinic and great leadership. So let's, let's do this. And so, um, started with Meg Academy and, and Brian brought a lot of great points to light and a lot of times it's easier from the outside looking in to see some areas where it's like look you don't have to do a whole overhaul but we need to yeah. harness the, the abilities that we have within the clinic and then look at opportunities for, for further um, advancement and um, so that was kind of what brought us on to doing you know with Brian and with Meg and and kind of continuing to build that structure. So what do you think has been the most impactful changes that you have made or that you've gotten from the training that you've received in terms of? Um, I would say, I mean, it, there's a lot of different levels of it, but I think that I, our whole thing of this is structure, but structure, it yeah. really yeah. is. I mean, you think about it as, you know, as kids, we thrive off of structure, you know, where it's like, okay, mm -hmm. we've got nap time at this time, we go to school, we <laughs> eat dinner, you know, and it's, it's yeah. the same way in professional practice, I think, where if you take the guesswork out of a lot of things, it makes everybody function way better. And it's, you're more efficient at what you do because everybody knows their lane. They know their role right. and from there. And then I'd say the biggest thing really is from a practice owner standpoint is, I mean, Jason was full time working in the clinic. 100% of the time seeing patients, trying to struggle to get everybody else going and and then, you know, so you like, you know, eat, slept, breathe, yeah. CEP, which I mean, he right. still does, but <laughs> it was almost like at a, you know, I'm, I'm drowning in this kind of thing. Right. So um, I think the establishment of, because I was already in a sort of role, you know, even in those years before Meg, I always had um, kind of above and beyond maybe a normal staff therapist as sure. what I did business development and for you know, stats and all that stuff. So I was kind of geared for that ahead of time, but then yes. it just gave more of an official role to me as being the COO of, look, everything comes through me. If there's a fire, then I'll let Jason know kind of thing. Right. And, and so um, just maintaining that line of communication between myself and Jason, but then handling kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. And so by taking a lot of today stuff off of his plate and giving him the ability to kind of trust in the process and trust in the yeah. structure that we built that really helped open him up for the opportunity to you know do working on the business instead of it yes. right and then um also to do some of his other endeavors that are really near and dear to his heart which is new pt tech so i think that yeah. that's been huge and i think um since all of this since we started we now have full-time treating therapist and then one that's coming on soon so we've grown a lot and we wouldn't have been able to scale or grow that without having the appropriate structure in place absolutely and I, I'm going to point out because again I've had the privilege of working with you but like Stephanie is the epitome of who you want in that leadership role <laughs> oh, it's, <laughs> it's not just about implementing structure it's about making sure you have the right people in the right place to be able to execute that structure and be successful with it. And I sincerely mean that because I, I know how you are a go above and beyond kind of person. So, um, you know, just keep that in the, the back of your mind too, when you're talking about implementing structure, it's also about right, you know, getting the right people in those, you know, particular posts uh, to make things sure things go right. But what mm -hmm. I think she said that I want everyone to take away from is to, to make sure that you establish, you know, that management team that you're working through and that you also have an objective way to kind of measure 
your staff's performance. Um, that's the other piece of that is to make sure that you establish the statistics and you know follow the metrics of how you're going to be measuring your team's performance. And that's, again, you're working through this, this management team to, to make sure that you're achieving those products in the different divisions. Um, but I, thank you, Stephanie, for uh, weighing in on that because I think that's really helpful. I want to transition over to LaToya because LaToya, I've had the privilege of working with as well uh, from a coaching perspective. And um, she is the office administrator. So I kind of want to get, you've kind of had a clinical perspective. I want you to give us kind of the LaToya office administrator perspective of, um, you know, first of all, tell us a little bit about True Sports and then your perspective in terms of uh, structure. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicole and Brian for having me on today. So as Nicole sort of said, okay. my name is LaToya. I'm the office administrator of True Sports PT. We are based out in Maryland. Um, we are, I would say population wise, about 75, 80% of our population is sports. So we work with anywhere, all levels, middle school, high school, collegiate and professional athletes. Maryland, we do have quite a few uh, professional, professional teams that are in the area um, that we work with. So um, prior, well, pre-COVID, pre -COVID, we um, just like everyone else, you know, Maryland was one of the states that were hardest impacted uh, when, when COVID hit and are still slowly beginning to um, open back up. We're not fully, have fully opened yet in our state. So we had a lot of uh, restrictions. Um, and from the administrative standpoint, we were faced with some tough challenges and having to furlough some staff some staff um, that were normally in the clinics on the day-to-day -day basis where we were able to set up new systems and structures and process for them to work from home that um, prior to this we didn't have. So right. it's definitely been um, a, a, a great learning club, a, a work, in, work in process. I don't think that we would be in the position um, that we are today if it hadn't been for, uh, you know, Nicole's leadership and her insistent and sort of, you know, coaching us through this through through, through afar um, yeah, currently yeah. as we are you know slowly you know our, our, our senses is sort of increasing um, some, and even still with that we're sort of spread out probably on a I would say within the six clinic within the six clinics a 30 mile uh, radius sure. so some of them uh, which are on our rural areas they have you know less impacted so they their caseloads have increased back up so where they may have dropped down to about 30 percent they're back up to 80 90 percent which is great but we have other clinics that are you know more populated or no located in more of the metropolitan areas where they're still you know numbers are still low and we still had to deal with staff um, just having it, issues in their own household with people being sick or childcare mm -hmm. issues that had closed that sure. um, we're still, you know, working through and working on, on, on revamping. Okay, good. You mentioned that a lot of the staff is working from home and I know you're yourself included. How, how has that presented, has it been challenging to manage people when they're working remote? Have, what, what have you done to um, kind of overcome that obstacle? Of the work yeah, from home. absolutely. And just to be clear from that, obviously uh, on our end, that's more so on the on our division one, so our administrative staff that right. you know would be working from home. The therapists yeah. are still on site, and even with, with right. telehealth and stuff, so they're still in the still in the clinics. Um, I would say a lot of it is just you know a lot of this is Zoom. Thank goodness for Zoom for in, in yes. all aspects, right? Through all of this. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. We <laughs> would be, be without it from from workouts to you know right. medical, right? So a lot yeah. of it has been through through Zooms. Um, we had to change our, our our film system so that we have different uh, softwares in place on how you know calls are being routed and forwarding yeah. the calls. So for for a patient's point of view, they're calling our same number, but the calls are being uh, routed to you know us at home and checking the voicemails sure. and even even looking at um, how we were still able to collect payments and copies and the deductibles and. Um, through right. all of this, we also had to still, you know, keep up with the insurance side of things and insurances and also even um, undergoing additional credentialing and different insurances and things that as with people losing their jobs and being laid off, we had a yeah. huge hit of that um, in Maryland with people having COBRA's insurances. So commercial insurances that we accepted, now they may be on state-based plans. 
that we had to enroll and look at it from, from that angle as well. Right. And I think you make a great point and you have to really, we've had to be innovative and adaptive. I think you mentioned that too, Stephanie, um, in this environment. And I think that's the people that are really going to not only survive this crisis, but are really going to thrive for after because not everybody is going to be as nimble and as uh, adaptive in this environment. So again, I applaud you both for um, doing such a wonderful job through this time. You mentioned um, having to change your phone system. I think, you know, environment is one of the things that we train on and I know we're focusing more on structure today, but that is very true. I mean, we, we are in a new environment. We're forced with this whole COVID thing that we're going through. So which means we have to reevaluate our other aspects of our environment, equipment being one of them. And I wanna make mention of a phone system that I you know, want you guys to look into. We've had some clients who have used it that are really appreciating it and liking it. It's an internet phone system. It's called Weave. So again, for people like yourself, Latina, Latoya, sorry, um, you, you have um, people working from home and you maybe not have as many people available to answer the phone. Uh, what this does is it sends a text message to whoever that point person is you want it to send to um, so that if it is something pressing like someone trying to get in for an evaluation, you're alerted to that and then you can address it and get back to them right away so you don't, you know, potentially lose that patient. So I think, you know, any ideas that you guys have, we, uh, we hear this from our clients I and mean, this one has been brought to my attention from our client. So if you have those ideas, we really try and reshare those out. Um, if somebody's winning with, with some system or software. Um, so I, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I'm glad, to hear about, I'm glad to hear about Weave because we've actually, we're just getting ready to sign a contract for, but well, not sign a contract, but sign up with them because sure. Um, we were having an issue with, you know, with both clinics kind of operating. And then we also, we had to kind of build out into a third location um, yeah. because of our, our one location is located with inside of a gym sure. and that was an appropriate treatment environment for a lot of our Medicare age yep. uh, population during COVID. So we actually now have this tertiary space and um, yep. like, how do we get the phone? And, and there's one number and then we have to yep. route it was just a disaster plus our fax line is an old yep. fax to a printer that is at that one location and it's yep. a disaster so i'm we one of weaves features was that you could yep. do the electronic faxing to the number and anybody can receive yep. it you can also do yep. a call free. so anyways that's yes my bar, but little I'm plug like, there for weave <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. so yeah <laughs> Use it and like get back to us. We want to make sure we're, you know, down the road hearing success stories on it too. Yeah. Um, so we can continue to promote it if it's something that's going to be helpful to our people. But Latoya, I want to also get back to you and, and I want you, because you have a little bit different setup, you know, you have six clinics that you're overseeing and managing. And I want you to tell me pre-Meg some of the struggles. And I, I, you know, I smile a little bit because I know back then when you were first signing on, I was the one working with you and it was like, Whew, we, we, had a lot of, we had a lot of work to do and a lot of structure to implement. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you were having before um, signing on with Meg? Right, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, I, and, quite, and quite frankly, prior to joining Meg, um, we really didn't have um, much, much of anything, I would say. You know, it was sort of, we, we had um, PTs that, you know, they, they dealt with the patient. And we had front desk staff that they were responsible for scheduling and verifying insurances and, and collecting collecting copies. That essentially was it. So um, after Meg, of course, it just really changed just to just have a different mindset and sort of look at things from a proactive standpoint. We were very um, reactionary. So with Meg and just having um, having the organization structure and just looking across all the different divisions and everything just having key objectives to sort of measure the various positions has definitely, um, it's, it's been a blessing. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> it's been a, it's been I'm glad. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're excited about it. Right. And, and I'm going to say the same thing, you know, as I said about Stephanie, Latoya is the person you want overseeing your, your admin side of things. I mean, overseeing division one, she is before. And what I remember Latoya is you like just juggling 
everything. And it was like almost too much on your plate. But now that you've implemented structure, you've been able to work through your office managers at the various locations. Um, and the other thing that you mentioned when we were talking about this is the onboarding program. And I know you guys are using the certifications. Can you tell us a little bit about how that has helped you do your job better in terms of onboarding people and making sure that people are um, performing at the level you want them to perform? Right. Yeah, I think the performance um, has been, you know, a great aspect of it. But I think the biggest thing for us has honestly just being more open and transparent about the process from start to finish. Even just watching those certification process and just little things like prime example for us uh, prior to Meg, just having a, a, a live application or, ha or letting the front desk coordinator know that someone may be interviewing or coming in for a PT position. We weren't, we weren't even, we didn't even, never came cross our minds prior to this. Right. So just going through those processes and giving them little tips of information, um, greeting them, and you know, to use Brian's you know, little tidbits there. I think those videos, um, yeah. and, and of course the coaching with you has, has been right. tremendous. And now we have right. key yeah. objectives from point A to Z from us, from the front desk coordinator yeah. to marketing, which we didn't have before, to even our billing and claims, which we actually outsource for. Um, in which we've done prior to Meg, but now we have key objectives that we can sort of right. measure their, um, you know, me measure them as well. Absolutely. Even if you're outsourcing services, whether it be marketing, whether it be billing, you still need to make sure they're performing at the level that is worth the exchange of what you're paying for that outsourced service. So I, you know, appreciate that you've implemented that and have followed through. And I think the other big thing that you were kind of alluding to, too, is also the, the biggest thing with onboarding is the consistency aspect. And if everybody is kind of being onboarded and trained the same way um, for like, let's say, for example, the front desk coordinator position, your likelihood of them, you know, performing at the same level, at the you know, same manner um, is going to be a lot higher and, you know, things are going to be missed. So that's one of the things that we've really we're trying to be mindful of when we created these certification programs is to make sure that we're giving everybody that gets goes through the system is being onboarded the, the exact same way. Um, so things aren't being missed. Um, okay, thank you for sharing that. I do want to uh, ask a couple of questions that we often get and Brian, I'll kind of focus this one uh, towards you to get started. We, we often do these practice assessments and we will have like a startup um, clinic or a very small clinic, and they'll say, why do I need to consider structure now when it's just two people? What would you say to that? Well, for the same reason why you have these two people, uh, you know, these two professionals on your live Zoom chat, right? What, what the goal of an owner is typically uh, is unfortunately the wrong goal when they first start out. They, they really have to develop into thinking like a CEO. All too often PTs go into private practice and they think like, I'm a PT who happens to own a clinic. And so they build the clinic around their PT mindedness. And quickly they realize, oh my gosh, I am like carrying everything on my shoulders. I'm doing everything. And there's only so many mental attention units I have. And I'm diverting my attention to all these things in such a quick, short paced um, segmented period of time that I can't give enough thought to give an appropriate answer or to think about the, re the, the, the reactions or the, or, or the uh, response to this answered question and what it's going to have an, a trickle down effect in other parts of the company. And that goes to like what Latoya was saying. And I really, I really want to echo that. It's what you don't know that really holds you back in practice. What you do know, you're probably going to give it the best college try you can. You're going to do the best. But like Latoya said, we didn't know we should be more transparent with our staff. We didn't know that that was going to change the company culture like it did. We didn't know that we should let everybody know that we got an entry-level PT coming in for an interview day today because it's interview day and everybody should. We, once we knew, it was an easy thing to flip over. But oh my gosh, what a difference it was when we did, you know. Both of these office, you know, chief operating officer, office administrator have seen tremendous growth because what you've done, whether you have two people, three people, or a hundred people, what you've done is you've now put your focus from an owner perspective, you put your focus on the people. And when you put your focus on the people and you realize your mission in private practice is to turn people into power players. 
And you want to have as many power players surrounding you as you possibly can, because the amount that you can row and the quickness in which you can get through these waves behind me and off to a safe distance <laughs> on shore is so much greater when you have those power players. And that's my message to so many people. I mean, I know, Nicole, you know, obviously I think the world of you and your abilities and they just continue to grow and grow. Although jogging is not your strong suit recently <laughs> not. due to the recent twisted <laughs> ankle that you suffered today. Um, and here she is on her yeah. zoom chat, right? That, that shows dedication. But I do know like just recently for both of you and I, Nicole, just both of us, I've got a PT owner who's been in private practice for 20 years who consulted with me five years ago and is looking to flip into Meg Academy because he's like, you know, it was great that you were able to handle me, but I need consistent, competent, comprehensive tools that are going to enhance the skills of the people around me. And that's what Steve is talking to you about. Like, how can you help me get the training, not the teachings? Anybody can sit in a seminar or listen to a podcast or book and walk away with 10%. But how can I walk away with 100% of application? And that's why structure is so important. And here's somebody who already did consulting with us. And now he's like, no, right. I have to invest in my staff. Well, which staff? Who do you right. hire? What chair do you put them in? If you don't map out your next 12 months, your next 18 months, and you don't figure out, like, I live in New Jersey and I want a vacation in Florida. Where am I going to do my overnight stay? Where am I going to have to fill up with gas? Where am I going to do that? If you don't figure that out, the people who are long for the ride, they get confused. They get confused. They get just demoralized. They feel like, oh, you're just asking me to do one more thing. Oh, I'm on this wheel, this hamster wheel. When is it going to end? Or when am I going to hit a finish line? Or when am I going to feel that validation versus that appreciation? Yeah. That's and what I, I think is so important is we teach you how to put in the structure bring in the right people and give them the appropriate appreciation for who they are as a person, but validation for what they are capable of doing as a result of your investment in them. I don't think a lot of PT owners think that that's the business they're in, but that's exactly the business you're in. Yeah. And, and I, I want to say, I get excited when we get a startup who comes in and understand and gets it and like, okay, I know I have to, I have to set the foundation now Yes. So that five years from now, I'm not like backtracking and undoing because I yes. never set the foundation. And I, I see that all the time in doing these practice assessments where people come in and are like, oh, it was me and my wife and we, you know, grew, 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 grew. grew. And now here we are a year and a half later. And I'm like, I'm drowning and yes. I, I have no work-life balance. I, I'm, you know, working 80 hours a week. Yes. I can't make my, my business grow. We've plateaued because yes. I can't even get someone in to hire them because I'm so busy seeing patients. So I, I feel like we hear that story time and time again. And I, my next question actually was, how can I create a better environment so I can work on my business and have work-life balance? Like, how do I do that? Let's say I am that year and a half in and I don't, like, how do I do that? Where do I even start? Yeah, well, I'm gonna answer this quickly by just saying to those of you who are watching this video, watching this live Zoom chat, rewind back to when Stephanie was doing her introduction and she was saying to you, because the answer is right in her real life experience. Stephanie's saying, hey, it was 2014 to 2016 and nothing happened. We kept doing the best we could. We kept doing with what we knew. We kept putting the same wrench on the same nut and turning it because that's what we knew. But our numbers didn't change and, and, and he just became less and less and less solvent. So here I come and I show up and I look at his clinic and I'm like, well, you're lacking this, you're lacking this, you're lacking this, and we need to work it, but you need to do a strategic approach. And he's like, oh gosh, I got to spend money at a time I don't have money. I'm like, well, don't wait. For those of you that are listening, don't wait to the point where you're like that. But if you are like that, what, what are you going to do? I mean, if you have a better solution, then you should be going and doing that. And Jason trusted us and he came on board. And the first thing we did is what you just said, Nicole, environment. When I walk through a clinic, I go outside your clinic with my phone, take my old iPhone 10 here. I don't know where my video camera is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in I, the ocean. 
Uh, it's in the ocean. I videotaped the outside of your yeah. building, your traffic, your signage, your door. What does it say? I walk through your clinic. Where do the people walk? How much space do they have? Where, how many production centers do you have? You know, that's an important number to know. Most people don't know that. Stephanie mentioned something that I thought was so, uh, I'm so impressed because I know she's doing her training because she's like, <laughs> oh, ever since we learned about the 85% rule and we learned how to actually bring people on without suffering an income loss, we're able to scale up with as many therapists as we want want when we want how many listeners right now are listening to this and they are a bit confused when should i hire that next therapist how do i afford their salary while i'm ramping them up and i'm like afford their salary they should cost you nothing like if you do this right you don't go in the red when you hire your next therapist you're in the black the whole time there's an 85 percent rule you need to know how to do that and stephanie's like ever since i learned that i can scale my business and that's why to your point nicole startups our absolute favorite. We get about eight of them a year. Every single one of them is break even within the first four to six months. Why? Because they know what they need to do ahead of needing to do it. That is good structure because you have it laid out in front of you. When Nicole moved out in Wisconsin and built that farm that she had, she knew the foundation of the house had to go in place before the pole barn went up. Then that before the horse barn went up and then, you know, the little livestock. So you have to kind of do it in sequence. It's the same thing about a private practice. You can't treat it like a summer cottage and you just keep adding additions before you know it, the floor plan's all messed up and you're in business six years and you're like, what are we doing? Right. Yeah, I think yeah. that we're a, the primary example of why a, a small clinic even, you know, if because in, in our origin, it was the owner and then myself and right that's a small clinic as it comes basically. And, and, you know, and, and I trusted what I was going to do and he, he, you know, he trusted me, but it was, as we looked at it from an outsider's point of view, it was like, gosh, we don't have any, any like real plan set in place. And then it, as when you're talking about adding staff or wanting to add anything, it's like, if you don't have that structure and you don't have also the metrics to, to guide that structure, then it's like you're constantly moving the goalposts. You're flying right. your pants like, oh, I guess, yeah, we're going to do that. Or, oh, what, what is our PTO policy? I don't know. I just yeah. a few days off, you know? And so it's it's little things like that. If you can map it out first, and we do this yeah. with everything, with business strap planning, with marketing plans, whatever. It's it If you map it out in a in a big picture, long, long-term scenario, it's so much easier. And you're not having to decide by emotion on the fly. Yeah deciding yes. following your plan and and I think that that has carry over to to a personnel perspective of your staff the staff that you do bring on and you train and you onboard them and get them going but in the in the status sheets you clearly outline okay look in exchange for your salary we are now expecting this out of you and if we're not getting those production metrics we're not meeting those goals then what then and for and I think about it too because having those stats is I feel like as a person, I am a, um, I, have a, I have a good degree of confront. However, I am also conflict adverse where I don't, mm -hmm. I don't like discord. I don't like, yeah. feeling like yeah. oh, I really like that person and I don't like right. you. Um, those metrics are, are, they speak for themselves. So if you have a therapist producing or not doing what they need to be doing, it's not, oh, actually, I don't like you. Um, right. I'm gonna have to You're so you right. go. You yeah. know, instead yeah. you say, look, this is what we expected. This is what you're giving. You're not meeting it. Okay. Yes. Yep. You're so Very right, objective. Stephanie. You're so right. And it trickles over to Latoya and how she mm -hmm. says she's handling her multi-office practice as well. Yes. Because now you walk away from like, for those of you watching, like what Stephanie's saying is you can't manage personnel by personality. You have mm -hmm. to manage your personnel by performance. To measure, to manage them by performance, you have to have the right statistics, the 64 key statistics that measure the appropriate performance levels you want from every position. And here's Latoya sitting here explaining like just so yeah. nonchalantly with total calmness, like, yeah, we've got these offices in the burbs and they're up yeah. to 70, 80% because they're doing, yeah. and we got these other offices in the, in the city that are like at 35, 40%. She's not panicked. She's not stressed. Yeah. She's talking about it like, I'm gauging their growth in proportion to their environment and scaling the personnel necessary to bring them back online as I dictate, as I'm driving the car. Mm -hmm. So many practices we meet, Nicole, they're not literally driving the car necessarily. Yeah. I know the clients yeah. that you just emailed this morning, uh, their first names were, yeah. you know, E yeah. and B, right? And <laughs> they're like, 
we know we need to do these things. We know, yeah. but you know what we need? We need somebody to march us through it because we don't even trust ourselves to be yeah. compliant enough to see it from start to finish. And mm -hmm. that is 90% of PTs. Why? Because you didn't go to CEO school. You didn't get your MBA in running the business. You didn't become a personnel management director. You became a therapist. Yes. So you come into a group like us and you get the best of both worlds. You get the technology that you can utilize with yourself and your staff and you get the coach to yeah. keep you going and keep encouraging you, keep yeah. pushing you, holding you to the deadline. So that's why we have such a high success rate because we don't let you have any room for failure. We're yeah. like, keep going, time to do yeah. the next thing. Yeah, and I think Brian, we had this conversation the other day about what it means to, to have a coach. I mean, you're, you were an athlete and you know, yep. I, you, you know, you recall back to when you were playing um, overseas, that when you got that personal coach, you just elevated your game. You know, you just are gonna take it to the next level. So even if you are performing great, there's yeah. always room for improvement. And, and we get someone objectively. Know. Yeah. And when you get someone objectively kind of analyzing it systematically that is dealt with, you know, people throughout the country, you know, we get all the little insights and little tidbits. And what I thought, Latoya, what I thought you said so well um, earlier is that you're not reactive anymore. You have a plan. You're proactive. You're ahead of it. You're thinking, you know, forward thinking rather than like hindsight thinking. And I think that, you know, makes a world of a difference too. So anyway, I, I, and I think Latoya, this conversation. I think, <laughs> and I think Latoya communicated confidently, like her and her owner are on the same page with yeah. the objectives that they have to achieve. There's no guessing. Like we yes. know where we're going with our group and we can get our group on the bus traveling yeah. with us, rowing as hard as the rest of us to achieve it. That yeah. is the company culture we're looking at. And I know that young couple that you're talking about, Nicole, that you're working with, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of good things in. That's the thing. When people have a lot of good things in, we're not here to sit here and make that wrong. We're mm -hmm. like, that just strengthens it even more. But we're yeah. here to give you the advanced skills, the advanced thoughts, the advanced principles, the advanced communication organization and gaining agreement with your company. Because it's the power players that you put in the chairs around you that are going to make all the difference in your life. You as an owner deserve to have work-life balance as much as the employees are coming out of school today, currently, according to last week's article, with $153,000 in debt, and they're sitting here telling you, can I get an $85,000 a year salary with four weeks off vacation and blah, blah. Yeah, I'd love everybody to have that, you know, but you have to work for it. It has to be in balance, that's all. Yeah, and um, okay, very good. Um, next question. What should I expect my, my clinical director to be responsible for? Like, what, what should I establish in terms of what they should be responsible for? Maybe, Stephanie, you want to go ahead and answer, shoot an answer uh, at this one since you're the sure, clinical Sure, but I'm trying to understand the question a little bit more. You mean... So like, when you establish that kind of middle management team, let's say we're a small practice and you, find, you know, finally get to the point where you need somebody managing over your clinicians, what, what do you, how do you measure their you know, success as an owner. And you don't have um, to take it. Brian, Brian could take well, it too. Yeah, no, I was <laughs> just, I'm trying to say because we, it's a little bit difficult because of, you know, my role is a little bit different than maybe a traditional clinic director, but right. I think that it's still, um, we would still operate over the clinic's statistics of if we have a visit statistics that we're trying to, to hit per week or per month or whatever. And then it's that clinical director's responsibility to make sure that the rest of their staff, yes. the staff therapists are meeting their production goals and their, yes. if they have any other outside goals. You know, in our company being small, people sometimes wear nondescript hats where, or they have multiple hats that there might be things that they're responsible for outside of maybe just treating patients. Mm -hmm. so, in our status sheets with them, we've outlined what those maybe additional metrics are, um, if it's not just a, a production of patients' visits or something like that. Um, and then, so it's the clinical director's job to assess each of those um, people on their team to say, look, how are we doing? What are we doing here? Um, hey, we're not meeting these production goals. Is that a byproduct of just our, is our census low? Is it yep. you in particular, you know? Right. It's, having trouble with drop off of patients. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Basically the, I see it as it's more of like the problem solver for that clinic and the, the clinic's normal operations um, as far as keeping everybody on track 
to meet the clinic's goals and then ultimately yeah. to um, kind of be the relayer of information to the owner as far as because um, I think the owner's job at this point when they've been able to kind of step back from working in the clinic is you know their goal is to remove obstacles from the team's way so everybody knows you know we're going down this track but the clinic owner is now in a spot where they're able to be the obstacle remover so if there's like an issue or something that needs to be fixed or addressed both environmentally or personnel wise that the yeah. clinic director is not able to do then that would be what gets relayed up to to the owner at that point okay perfect and that's what i was really alluding to is you know the tracking by statistics so we're measuring to make sure that clinical director is responsible to make sure their team is performing at an optimal level and you're inserting whether it's training or disciplinary action or some some action that you're going to be able to drill down into those statistics and really figure out what the problem is and address that problem. So I think that's great. Latoya, from an admin's point of view, and again, being over uh, multiple clinics, how are you functioning to work through your team members as the office administrator? Yeah, similar, similar to sort of what, um, to what Stephanie said, you know, we're definitely looking at those Looking at those stats, you know, we, we utilize the stat grids on a, on a daily basis. We do um, even just focusing on that, that give me five drill, just learning more about each individual employee, but even as our, our, our patients as well. So we, we com combine those two with learning more about, you know, our personnel, our patients, and then looking at those key stats from an admin standpoint. And that was our biggest thing that we did not have prior to MAG is having key objectives um, aside from, you know, yeah, we know that our cancellation rate is, you know, 10%. We, we know we want to improve on that. Right. Um, how can, what other things can we have right. them look at? And like you said, allowing, empowering them to take ownership of it yes. so that it's not just falling on, of course, the owner um, of the practice, but myself, you know, giving them owner and just say, hey, you know, these right. are the things that, that yeah, you are in control of now. Right. Anything. To, yes, absolutely. Brian, anything to add to, um, well, to the, that, yeah, that's questions. a really good question. I'm going to do it in 25 seconds or less. Cause I know Nicole good. has other questions. <laughs> if you're watching this and you're a clinical director or you're an owner and you're going to turn to your clinical director after watching this zoom chat and you're going to bring them some valuable information, bring them this. First of all, understand that your focus for your clinical director should be that they take ownership over how that clinic is operating one week to one month out. Their headlights, the headlight beams of their car can only look one week to one month out. Number one. Number two, make sure that it's paramount that they understand that each and every week to some degree, greater or lesser, they should be focusing on three things with each individual member of that team. Assuming you have an office manager addressing the administrative staff, you have a clinical director addressing the clinical staff, that clinical director should be addressing with each individual monitor, quality, efficiency, and productivity. Now productivity is, am I giving an exchange in abundance with each and every interaction that I have with each and every patient every day? Efficiency is, am I managing my time, documenting well, coming in early, you know, kicking off? Am I Gabby Gus? Do I have to reel it back so that I can be efficient to help as many people in my community as possible to clinically see the appropriate number of people per week per my status sheet so that I'm giving back to my community as much as I can? And thirdly, quality. And quality goes to what Latoya just said. The clinic needs to back you. You need the full backing of the owner and the entire organization to fully achieve quality. I want to cut my head off and throw myself off a roof every time I hear pay for performance. And the only thing they're talking about is the clinicians outcomes or achievement of their short and long-term goals. Do you know how little that means to the patient in reality terms? The patient wants to know that they can feel better that they're in less pain, that they can move better, they can play with their grandkids, that they can tie their shoes, that they can get in and out of their car, the functional things of life. And again, you're listening going, well, those should be in the functional goals. Yes, that's true, but the quality of that life, the experience within that clinic measures their quality. Do you know when you're dealt fairly uh, with a car dealership, you're gonna go back and buy another car because they treated you and granted you your beingness as a person, a human being. And that's what Latoya is saying. You got to do that as a full clinical effort. It's a full court press. Give me five drill. 
monthly yeah. games with patients, monthly games with staff, you know, putting up there the success stories, you know, where's the, the patient theater? You got to have a patient theater when they walk in and they can see what's all the awards you've won and all the success stories for the, you've got to make that experience where they feel so fortunate to be in your four walls. And if you don't have an intro video on your website saying, hi, I'm the owner of, you know, CEP physical therapy. And let me just give you a quick tour of our clinic and let you know what you can, ex what you most likely are going to experience when you come here and get care from us. That reaching out to the patient personally, that kind of stuff is what we teach in Meg because you have to look like the zebra in the herd of horses today. Yes, I agree. And I think I would love that you focus so heavily on the admin side of things and the front desk. I mean, we always preach that, the front desk coordinator is like the most important yes. position in your company yes. because they're the yeah. first face that people see, the first voice that people hear, the first you know experience and uh, with that your company that they're going to have. So um, we place a heavy influence, uh, you know, uh, yes. attention and detail into the training of the front desk staff. Every so. single patient should feel like, wow, no matter who I spoke to, I always felt like they were advocating for yes. me. In Meg Academy, we never talk customer service. We don't even know what that means. That water, that yeah. word is so diluted. It's patient advocate. How are you advocating in the best interest of that patient? It's the same way Nicole takes on all these new owners every week. You advocate in your best interest. What is in best, what is yeah. best line up for them? Not for us. We're fine. What is the yeah. best for you? That's how right. you should be thinking if you want to run a healthy practice. Okay. And I think that's well said, Brian. I, I, we are going to wrap it up because we only have a few minutes left. What I do want to end on are just some final closing thoughts. So um, Latoya, if you want to start us off, if there's anything you want to leave in terms of advice or tidbits or tips, um, pieces of information you want to, to leave our, our viewers with, uh, let's go ahead and start with you. Yeah, absolutely. One, one. just thanks, thanks again to both you, Brian and Matthew, for having me on today. And oh, I would just pleasure. say, um, I don't, you know, it's hard to, you're not really sure uh, where the viewers are on today, but if there are any, um, you know, PT owners or administrators that are on the call today and they're just sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place and they're not really sure what the future lies ahead for them and they um, are looking at different companies, I highly, I know we looked at different companies, I highly recommend uh, cool. going with Meg just to help Thank you, Toya. your business and to uh, head you in the right direction, not only in these, you know, <laughs> uncertain <laughs> times, but, but, but as we all get through this one, one depth of time. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, Toya. You. Thank you. All right. Stephanie. Any closing yeah, I, thoughts? I second, I second what Latoya said as far oh, as... I promise I didn't pay them, guys. I didn't pay them to say this. Because <laughs> like Brian and Nicole and the whole Meg team, it's like, oh, it's thank you. kind of nice to have somebody in your corner and and who really understand what it's like to, to be a physical therapist, to have a physical therapy practice, you know, because you know, like Brian said many times, like we didn't, we went to PT school, we didn't go to management school, business school, whatever. And so it's we're doing ourselves a disservice if we're trying to operate a business that, and we don't have that training um, and skills that we need. And, and to have the perspective of Meg, you know, with the physical therapy side of it, it's like that that's intangible because not only is it help, but it's help that knows directly what impacts us day to day um, and, and can give really quality advice for our very specific niche market of, uh, physical therapy and, and mostly private practice physical therapy where it's therapist owned and it's a tough world when you feel like you're kind of going in alone and a lot of times it's like you, you know that you need to do something but you're not really sure what and right. um, just to have a, an outside perspective I think is invaluable um, just to make sure that you're doing everything you can to make your business and your practice as successful as you want it to be and as it should be you know and We've talked all the time about how owners, you know, you're, you're shouldering the burden of, of everything for this dream or this, um, you know, this vision that you had. So don't let it become something that's a little storm cloud hanging over you or, or you feel like you're handcuffed to it or you're, you're not really sure what to do because there's definitely help to be had. And so um, the more that you can get that help and then apply that structure and train everybody from management all the way down to your, your staff members, um, it, it's really invaluable and, and we've seen that firsthand as far as our company goes. And, and I know, you know, hundreds of thousands of clinics, I'm sure yeah. <laughs> on the advice that uh, you all have been able to provide in the coaching. 
Oh, we appreciate that so much. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I said, these, I love these guys. I, 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 we do feel like, you know, yeah. our, our people are our family. And I know I say it all the time, but I truly believe that. And I want, you know, people to win that are our clients you know, as much as I would want myself Yeah, and to I win, think so. that it's like, you know, it's, it, you guys definitely embody that whole go-giver mentality. Mm -hmm you know, by helping others, you're, you're helping to, to build your, yourself and, and meet your own goals and things like that. And I think that definitely that, that emanates from our interactions is that it's, it's that wanting us to all succeed. And it's like yes. being a champion in your corner of like, yes, you can do it. You can be successful. Oh, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> thank, thank you, Stephanie. Brian, kind of closing thoughts. Um, really quick, I, I think if you watch this and you see me and listen to my podcast, you hear the enthusiasm in my voice and you hear me get excited and stuff. And I don't know if that's everybody's cup of tea, but if you were in my shoes or if you're standing behind me and you're trying to follow somebody into battle or you're trying to follow somebody to successfully climb a mountain, I would think you want to follow the person who's pretty energetic about what they're doing. And I think that's what is so great about Nicole and I with her school teacher mentality and enthusiasm. <laughs> The two of us are able to literally take great <laughs> new thoughts and ideas and concepts. And I, I've been researching, I'm going to show you why my screen is on the palm trees because I've been working out for days now on a new shared risk model. And I'm like scrapping and re-scrapping and building and rebuilding all these kinds of things because it's for you. It's like, you know, there's a new world of physical therapy that we have to confront moving forward. And I'm going to leave you guys with this message. I have been I, I don't know. I, I must have spent four hours or five hours by now researching multiple resources to um, what I'm going to shoot after this tonight is a new podcast. And I'm going to write a blog about my title. They say the PT world has changed forever. Has it? <laughs> and I want to try to answer that question for you because it's our goal to give you the tools necessary for you to think with first so that you can create on second. So you're always in that top 10% of physical therapy practices across mm -hmm. the nation. So I wanna leave you with that. That's why my communication is so enthusiastic and so energetic because I'm creating future, you know, tasks, tools, you know, concepts, Ideas. strategies, systems for you, but without the right structure, without the power players, you're gonna have a hard time. So I'm gonna leave you with three tools right now. Please make sure you understand you do not want to hire people with an employment letter. You absolutely have to establish a, a, an exchange and abundance relationship from the get-go with a status sheet. Number two, set up 10-minute meetings with every employee in your company at least monthly and let them talk about whatever they want, cats, dogs, aunts, uncles, but you got to be interested in your employees and staff. And number three, absolutely have a performance planning review form that you go over in their first 90 days and you go over annually because that sews you together. It, this, they're not working for you. They're working with you to achieve a common purpose and common goal. So if you are going to ask me the question, last question on Nicole Sheet, when is it time to assemble a management team? It's time to assemble a management team when you get through that first year because now you're established and now you have to put the power players in place. So that's my advice to you guys. I hope you jotted those little t tips down. And Nicole, I'm sorry I went over my time limit, but I can't help myself. That's all right. We're still within that hour time frame. All so right. I think we did really good. All thank right. you again, Stephanie. Let's, thank you again, you Latoya. Thank you. you guys were amazing today and really super insightful. And I really, really appreciate you sharing your experiences with us um, and for also, you know, validating what we do. You know, I really, I'm really, really proud of us at Meg. And I, I, when I hear your guys's acknowledgement of that, it just makes what, you know, makes me want to even work harder. So I appreciate um, those kind words that you both have said. One um, last statement. One last statement. Yes. If you're doing it right, it feels like fun. If yes. you're doing it wrong, it feels like work. Right. So ask yourself that question. Does this feel more like work or is this feeling more like fun? Because obviously you can see we have a lot of fun here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Over. On that note, you guys, we will see you next month. Just a yep. reminder, we're not going to be meeting weekly now. We're going to be meeting monthly. But again, please tune in. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and we love you shooting in questions, your questions that you're struggling with. So um, keep them coming and thank you and have a good day. And have fun. Thanks, guys. Yes. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>